In a world torn by war and threaded with magic, one hero rises from the ashes of a devastating battle. Meet Naruto, a warrior bonded with a powerful demon fox, on a quest to rewrite history and save his people. Join him on a journey through time, where loyalty, strategy, and supernatural abilities collide in an epic fight for survival. This isn't just a story, it's a saga of friendship, sacrifice, and unwavering determination. Before we get into the story, don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Now for the story. Horse coughs disrupted the heavy surroundings as dying flames crackled quietly across the corpse-littered ground. A body stirred amongst the rubble and ash as one bloodied hand reached up to sweep aside dirted locks of blonde hair. Is he dead, Karama? The demon fox's voice was faint when the answer came. As dead as he possibly can be, Kit. Even his body's been completely destroyed. A pause followed for several heartbeats. But we're not far behind either. A dry half-chuckle was offered at this statement as Naruto heaved himself into a sitting position, ignoring the blood that dripped from his wounds and joined the dark crimson already staining the battlefield. No doubt. I can practically feel our chakra leaking away. Can't believe how strong that bastard is. The fox didn't reply, and under normal circumstances, Naruto would have been worried that the demon merged with him now found it too exhausting to even speak. Instead, the blonde turned dull blue eyes to the broken figure lying only a few feet away, a hole in his chest, limbs twisted in an ugly rendition of a ragdoll. Naruto released a bitter scoff at this, too drained to even consider crying for his fallen best friend. He hadn't cried since his godfather had died. The irony here was painful. Once upon a time, he had been the one struck down like this, almost killed by the very attack that Madara had slaughtered Sasuke with not even an hour ago and the Chidori hadn't even been aimed at the raven-haired Unbu general in the first place. His stupidly proud, unbelievably protective, brilliant best friend had jumped in the way at the last second. Hey, kid. Naruto blinked slowly, pulling his wayward thoughts back together as the Kyuubi's soft, almost wavering voice thrummed in his mind. What is it? What do you think you're doing? The blonde frowned, dragging himself over to some leftover debris to lean against a slab of fallen rock. He doubted he could stand anymore. What does it look like? There's nothing left. Kanoa's gone. Madara's gone. Not much left to do, but wait until I go too. A feeble snort batted at him, somehow managing to convey the same amount of annoyance the QB once did at full strength. That's a pathetic way to die. And I for one am not going to just roll over and wait until death takes us like some common dog. Naruto would have rolled his eyes if he had the energy left to do so. Don't think we have much choice, Kurama. Unless you want me to commit traditional suicide. A growl berated him. Think? You damn brat. Last time I checked, you were a few injutsu master. What were you working on after that pervert of a Sani was killed? Naruto blinked, mind sluggishly retrieving the memory of a complex seal he had started on after Jiraiya had died. In his grief, he had holed himself up in his apartment and had gone through stacks of paper and numerous jars of ink in a half-crazed attempt at reversing the event of the Toad Sanin's death. It had been a stupid thing to do, and he had always known in the back of his mind, that he would never go through with it. One man's death, no matter how precious to him, was not worth erasing his other friend's futures. He had put it aside after a week and a furious beat down from a subtly panicking Sasuke once the Uchiha had managed to break through his seals and into his apartment. But now? Now, what was there to lose? I have no paper, no ink, he thought stupidly even as he cleared a rough patch of ground in front of him. And it takes a huge amount of chakra. And it might not even work. You a blood, kid. And we still have enough chakra to pull this off if we pour everything we have into it. I'll be damned if you won't at least try. We have nothing to lose anymore. Focusing now on the seal he had come up with years ago seemed to lift the haze fogging his mind. Naruto held no doubts that it was mostly a last rush of adrenaline that forced him to concentrate even as his life continued to slip away like sand through spread fingers. But his hand was steady as he drew out the seal in his own blood. He only paused when he started drawing the time frame of the jump. Originally, he had drawn it out to be before Nagato's attack on the Toad Sanin. But if he was going to travel back, he might as well do it properly. Karama, how many years do you think we can jump? A decade, maybe a little more than that, the fox responded after a considering pause. And it would be easier if you jumped back to a significant point in time. Significant to you, I mean. Naruto remained still. The day of the QB attack was out of the question. That had been a significant date, and he had played a large part in it, but he had also just been a baby. There was no way he could jump back so far to a time he couldn't even remember. The Uchiha massacre was also impossible. 
As much as he wished to spare his best friend the loss of his family, he hadn't known Sasuke back then, and the Uchiha clan's destruction had never affected him directly. The best day to jump back to would probably be the day he had been assigned to Team 7. It had been one of the happiest days of his life, and had occurred before everything had gone downhill. Good choice, Kurama proved. It will take every last drop of chakra we have, but that is a strong point in time. It will serve as an anchor for us. Naruto nodded absently and quickly drew out the correct symbols before finishing the rest of the seal. His hand dropped back into his lap, studying the seal with a critical eye for any mistakes. Kurama, where will I end up once I get back? My apartment? On the streets of Kanoha? He frowned. In my twelve-year-old body? I can't do anything like that. The demon fox was quiet for a long moment, the silence contemplative. You will most likely still have your own body, the QB admitted eventually. Seals this strong consist of symbols, chakra, and the user's own desires. You wish for the ability to save your friends and family, as well as the village you call home. To do so, you would need the knowledge of this future and the abilities you have gained along the way. But to retain this self, you risk a paradox, where there will be two Uzumaki Naruto's running around in the same timeline. That should not be possible. It should not happen at all. But it will happen, Naruto thought back fiercely. I am going to change it all. Yes, Kit, I understand that, Kurama replied with a surprising amount of patience. And your desire to prevent another war of this magnitude and the eventual deaths of everyone around you will be strong enough to keep the paradox at bay. But it will not last forever. Your ultimate goal is Uchifa Madara. The things you change along the way will either help you towards this goal or simply hasten the inevitability of the same thing happening once again. Time is as rigid as it is flexible. You could prove to be strong enough to end up creating a completely different timeline, or prove too weak and end up with the same results. Time does not like being tampered with, but whichever outcome you end up with, it does not change the fact that you do not belong in that timeline. When your job is done, for better or for worse, you will simply cease to exist. As to where you will end up, that I do not know. Naruto had remained almost unresponsive throughout this entire explanation. Now he sighed, the movement causing a wave of agony to his already damaged lungs. I don't think I really mind, he thought detachedly. I've lived long enough. The only reason I want to go back is because this could be a chance to give everyone a different future. A better one. But if I am to disappear, you will disappear with me. I thought you wanted to live. A derisive scoff echoed in his mind as the QB shifted irritably. Only fools and cowards wish to live forever and I am neither nor both. I simply do not wish to die due to a murder-suicide and at the hands of Uchiha Madara no less. At this moment in time, we have accomplished nothing more than ridding a broken world of a mad Anne. When I finally leave this plane of existence for the next to meet my maker so to speak, I would like a little more than murder to my name. And since those higher beings up there seem hopelessly enamored with such pathetically weak humans such as yourself, preventing the apocalypse from wiping out your pitiful kind would be excellent fodder to throw back into their faces. Amusement stirred in Naruto's chest as the insults flew past him without harm. He was far too used to the QB reiterating his stance on humans to care. You don't seem to like those higher beings very much. I don't. They place nine demons in a world where much weaker creatures roam and give us unlimited power only to condemn us to an imprisoned life in a human container because we brought destruction to those who sought to destroy us. There is neither logic nor intelligence in their decision. No doubt, once I pass on, they will try to condemn me for said destruction. A dark smile curved the fox's mouth. But with this, I shall be ready to face them. Naruto just shook his head. He had never asked Kurama about any of the higher beings on high simply because he had no interest in them. As far as he was concerned, he carved his own path in life, and he would deal with any judgment dealt to him when the time came. All right then, are you ready? Immediately, the demon fox settled down and the QB's red chakra rose to the surface along with his own. Naruto focused on the seal, one hand pressing over it as he concentrated on that fateful spring day 14 years ago when he had finally made Jinan. Chakra flared around him, and the seal flared up under his hand. Gritting his teeth, he forced as much chakra as he possibly could into the seal, ignoring the immediate warning bells that told him when he was at his limit. This technique would take everything he had. All around him, the world exploded into a blinding landscape of white, the very air around him trembling with energy. An invisible force seemed to close around him, and Naruto only had a moment to wonder, distantly, whether or not he would end up arrested and in a prison cell before the day was up. And then, with a deafening roaring ringing in his ears that Naruto instinctively knew to be the rush of time, 
darkness engulfed him, and he knew no more. Kit. 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 Wake up. You lazy midget-sized pathetic excuse for a midday snack. Wake up this instant. Blue eyes snapped open and Naruto jerked up, almost banging his head against a low-hanging branch. With a low groan, the blonde's hands reached up to clutch at his head as a jackhammer set off inside his skull. God damn it, you stupid fox. I'm awake. What do you want? A snort and Naruto could almost see Kurama stretching smugly in his mindscape. We're back, Kit. Just thought you want to get a move on. You've been out for three hours. I was getting bored. Naruto would have shot something derogatory back at the demon if he hadn't been caught up in the fact that he was back. Because he knew this forest, knew it like the back of his hand. He was at the very edges of the forest of death in the shadows of one of the trees, and from his position, he could see the rest of Kanoha, real and bustling with life spread out before him. Karama, we did it. Another snort, this one more of fond amusement than anything else sounded in his mind. Yes, Kit, that's what I said. And it seems your wounds have disappeared. You have the scars to prove it, of course, not to mention that your clothes are abysmal, but your chakra reserves are almost back to normal and I feel better than I have in a long time. Naruto couldn't quite help the small grin that tilted his lips as he staggered to his feet, tugging absently at the torn clothing that hung off his thin frame. He hadn't felt happy in a long time, and it had been even longer since he had shown it openly, but this was it. This could be everything he had ever wanted, and the best part was that his younger self could grow up, ascend the ranks, and become Hokage without half as much suffering as he had gone through. This time, Uzumaki Naruto would have his friends around him, supporting him, and there would be no war to take away the millions of lives that had been lost in that other timeline. What will you do first? Naruto blinked, frowning thoughtfully as his eyes drank in his village. The old man. At least one person will have to know who I am. And I still have Bachan's necklace to show him. He's reasonable. I'll be able to convince him. The fox made a sound of agreement. Go on then. I'm going to sleep. Try not to get killed between here and the Hokage Tower. If anyone could, it would be you. Naruto rolled his eyes before performing a hinge. His blonde hair faded to normal brown, blue eyes quickly turned brown as well, and his clothes matched those of an everyday civilian. His hinge was also a few inches shorter, but his frame was the same slender build. All in all, he looked harmless and nondescript. Still, Naruto hurried along the streets of Kanoha, not lingering as he hurried towards the Hokage Tower. He would not be able to get in like everyone else as he had no identification on himself, but his gaze flitted to the open window of the Hokage's office, his eyes quickly pinpointing the small squad of Unbu on guard duty at the moment. Casually, he turned left, putting him parallel to his destination even as he disappeared from the Unbu guard's line of sight. And then, with a quick half-step to turn back towards the tower, Naruto pushed off from the ground, flashing past the guards and through the open window before coming to a halt in front of a startled Saratobi Haruzen. It was so easy that it would have been funny if Naruto didn't know this also meant that if he had been an enemy, the third Hokage would have been dead before anyone could have reacted. Speaking of reaction, Naruto already had his arms in the air in the universal sign of surrender as Unbu rushed towards him. Kanai extended and pointed at him. Saratobi had risen to his feet, eyes narrowed at him, body tense as his sharp gaze assessed the intruder. Hokage-sama, Naruto started formally. I mean you no harm, but I have something of great importance to speak to you about. If you would allow me to show you something, I would ask you to consider granting me a private audience with yourself. The sand dame stared hard at the brown-haired man, observing the now obvious hinge. This man, obviously a ninja, had entered his office before any of his unbu had even been able to react, and then had stood still while his guards had surrounded him. If he had meant any actual or immediate harm, this man could have already done it. Wordlessly, Saratobi nodded curtly, keeping his eyes on the man as one of the ninja's hands slowly reached into a hidden pocket and withdrew a necklace. Saratobi immediately stiffened, recognizing the necklace instantly. Where did you get that? He demanded as he came around his desk and contemplated whether or not the man would give it up without fuss. The hinge neen held out the necklace without hesitation. From a slug currently on quite the losing streak. Saratobi's eyes widened at the analogy and he studied the brown eyes for a moment longer. This man knew Tsunade, and while an enemy Nin could just as easily have gotten this information, he also knew his former student would never give up this necklace to some random shinobi. With a decisive nod, he turned to his unbu guards. Wait outside, he ordered, ignoring the silent protest that immediately flared up. Go. I can handle this. Reluctantly, the unbu withdrew, and once they had left the office, 
Saratobi quickly activated the privacy seals set up around the room. He turned back to the stranger, blinking in shock as the hinge dropped and a tall, slender frame blonde with piercing blue eyes stared back at him, a puzzling sort of affection tilting his lips. Minato. Saratobi whispered, taking a shaky step back. The blonde sighed, brushing a stray lock of hair away from his face. Not quite, old man. Try his son. I'm Naruto. The sand aim quickly pulled his thoughts together, steadying himself in the present as he studied the man in front of him. Now that he took the time, he could see the differences between the Yandame and this blonde. While the two had the same hair and eyes, this man, Naruto, was more slender than and not as broad-shouldered as Minato had been. His jawline and facial structure were deceivingly delicate but also held the same strength Minato had had. And the faint smile that still quirked the blonde's lips as the man waited patiently for him to finish his observations was all Kushina. Absently, Saratobi wondered if his laugh would be like Minato's. If what you say is true, Saratobi finally voiced carefully. Then you must be from the future. Naruto nodded, the slightest flicker of relief flitting across his features. Yes, 14 years in the future to be exact. Give or take a few months. Here, the blonde hesitated before forging on. You could ask me some questions to make sure. Saratobi didn't think anyone could pull off this sort of hinge, and not many people knew Minato and Kushina even had a son. Not to mention that the whisker markings on the blonde's face and the distinct Kyubi chakra he could now sense inside the younger man were dead giveaways. But a few identity questions couldn't hurt either. Who were your parents? Again, that faint smile appeared briefly, and Saratobi frowned inwardly at this implication. Naruto had always been optimistic, and always had a ready smile for all. For his expressions to have faded to a mere shadow of what it once was, still is now, was a clear indication that things in the future had not turned out well. Namake's Minato and Uzumaki Kushina. Saratobi nodded. Your godfather and godmother? This time, a shadow of pain and deep sorrow darkened the cerulean eyes before that two disappeared. Rea and Sanade. Saratobi blinked, startled. He lets you call him Rea? Naruto? for it really could be no one else, blinked back. Well, I also call him Aero Senin, but after I did that a couple of times in front of those women he tries to get to as well as a few dignitaries, he finally told me I could call him Rea instead, at least while in front of other people. The blonde scoffed a bit. There's nothing wrong with Rea. It's not perverted or degrading or anything. It's just a nickname. If he hadn't told me that he didn't let anyone else call him that, I would have ignored him altogether. Saratobi chuckled finally relaxing entirely. I used to call him that, but he insisted on his full name after he turned 15. He thought the name sounded too female and I believe Sanade somehow teased him enough when they were younger that Jiraiya now has the irrational impression that the name is a patronizing insult to his sense of self, or something of that sort anyway. He paused before continuing softly, you two must have been very close. The blue gaze darkened once again even as the blonde nodded curtly. Yes. Saratobi nodded and made no further comment on the matter, instead taking in the ripped clothing the ninja was wearing. Very well. I believe who you are. Now, why have you come back? Are things really that bad in the future? Naruto closed his eyes briefly before nodding. Kanoa is gone, he said simply even as Saratobi frowned at this revelation. Raised to the ground. It's civilians and shinobi all dead. I was the last. For a moment. Saratobi couldn't breathe as he tried to imagine a world where Kanoha no longer existed. He glanced at the window towards the rest of the village before looking back at the blonde. It wasn't just the inner strength that was so like Minato, Saratobi realized, because Kushina had had that strength as well. It was Naruto's entire bearing that reminded him most of Kanoha's yellow flash. This man currently standing in front of him, frame relaxed but ready, had the air of a Kage, and a powerful one at that. The kind of power that Saratobi had only ever seen Minato exude. You became Hokage then, Saratobi couldn't help but inquire. Naruto inclined his head in affirmation. Rokadame Hokage. The haunted look passed over the blonde's features once more. Just in time to watch my village burn. Saratobi almost shuddered at the near overwhelming grief in the younger man's voice. It was always hardest on the Kage when their people's lives were lost. The entire village was their responsibility after all. I came back to change it. Naruto suddenly looked almost anxious, and Saratobi found himself relieved as he caught a glimpse of the Naruto he knew in this time. The Sandame nodded briskly, turning to step back behind his desk. Of course, if Kanoha will fall then we will have to find a way to prevent it. But not now. Can I assume that nothing drastic will happen in the immediate future? 
Naruto frowned in confusion but nodded nonetheless. Everything will start going downhill at the next Chunin exams. Before that, as long as I keep an eye on things and root out some spies, things should be alright. Good. Saratobi pulled out a list of empty apartments and sent a reassuring look when Naruto stared in bewilderment at his assessment. If nothing will happen any time soon, I would like to get you settled in. You look ready to keel over, Naruto. The blonde blinked before looking down at himself. Oh, I just finished fighting my dash. Saratobi put up a hand to halt the younger man's explanation. Not now, Naruto. He chided gently. No doubt, if you continue, I will have many questions for you, and we will be in here for another few hours. Right now, you need rest, not to mention we still have to create a background for you. Naruto seemed to consider this for a moment before nodding silently in agreement. Very well. While you are here, you will need to use a different name. Do you have one in mind? Kazama Haruki, Naruto said after a moment's thought. That's the name I used when I infiltrated Iwagakir. Saratobi opened his mouth to ask before shaking his head ruefully. Questions later. But who knew Naruto had the potential to be a spy? All right, he continued on. I'll write up the necessary papers and tell anyone who asks that you've been on a mission for me for the past eight years. We can use the Hugo Affair, you know what that is? Good. We can use that and say you've been in Kumo to make sure they wouldn't try anything again. They won't try anything again, will they? Naruto shook his head. They won't be stealing any more Hugas anyway. But the council will want proof. Saratobi frowned. Indeed. Is there any knowledge from the future that you can use here? Naruto stayed silent, gaze flickering over to the window to stare absently out at the sky. How long can you keep the council at bay before they start asking questions? Saratobi shrugged. As long as you keep a low profile, word won't get back to them too quickly. But even if it does, I can hold them off for several days, maybe a week. Naruto nodded. All right. Give me five days. I can get to Kumo and back within that time. And I'll bring back Hyuga Hizashi's body. The bastards preserved it so I'll still be able to present an actual body. If Saratobi had been anything other than a Kage, he would have gaped. Wouldn't they keep that well guarded? Naruto shrugged. I can do it, old man. I'm above Unbu level, plus I've done it before. And I'll leave a body clone behind so they won't notice. As long as the Hyuga clan doesn't go flaunting it through the streets of Kumo, everything should be fine. The Sandame considered this for a few seconds before nodding in agreement. All right, I'll call a council meeting when you get back. You'll leave tomorrow. The blonde nodded. And I'll be back in five days. Good. Now for your looks. The village will be in an uproar if they get a good look at you. At first, and maybe even second and third glance, you look very much like Minato. Naruto frowned thoughtfully before performing a few one-handed seals. His long golden locks immediately washed away, leaving a crimson fire in its wake. The new redhead cocked a questioning eyebrow at the surprised Sandame. Saratobi smiled and nodded approvingly. While there were still traces of both Minato and Kushina on the former blonde's features, anyone would just dismiss it as a coincidence if they noticed. He couldn't detect the hinge either. Moving on to where you will be staying then. I'll take the apartment next to my younger counterpart. Saratobi blinked. How did you? Oh, right. Are you sure? Very. This way, I'll be able to keep an eye on him. Keep him company too. He'll get lonely sometimes. The Sandame frowned sadly but said nothing. He had a feeling this Naruto wouldn't appreciate it. Very well. Just show these papers to the landlady there and she'll give you the keys. He smiled warmly at the redhead. This Naruto exuded a quiet strength and seemed comfortable in his own skin. He had grown up well. Get some rest, Naruto. Naruto offered that faint half-smile again before tucking Sanade's necklace away and withdrawing a small paper seal instead extending it towards Saratobi. The Sandame blinked, taking the seal and noting the complex design. Just press it against any piece of clothing you wear, and it will automatically imprint itself onto the material, Naruto explained quietly. If you're ever in trouble, sending even a drop of your chakra into the seal will automatically inform me of your position, and I will be able to step to your location in an instant. Saratobi examined the seal curiously before pressing it to his Kage cloak's inside collar. A flash of chakra and the ink on the paper dissolved, reappearing on the cloak instead. What does it do? Hmm. This time, Naruto's smile held the faintest traces of mischief and Saratobi found himself hard-pressed not to smile back in the face of such familiarity. Try it. Reaching up, Saratobi sent a small current of chakra into the seal and then almost stepped back when Naruto appeared beside him, a quiet crackle of dry lightning as his only warning. Wide-eyed, 
Saratobi stared between the spot the redhead had been and the spot where he was now standing. Horation. Naruto was already shaking his head. One of my own actually, although it is based on the Horation. I call it Reika Haido Kiri no Jutsu. Same concept but less. Well, like my dad's I suppose. Enemies rarely see it coming. The seal helps me lock onto the location, but if I have a very clear picture of where I'm going in my head when I perform the jutsu, I can get there just as easily. Saratobi was speechless for several seconds. While he knew that this Naruto was essentially an adult version of the 12-year-old Naruto, it was still hard to connect the two. To think that Naruto would one day grow up to create his own jutsus sent a thrum of pride rushing through the sand dame. This is amazing. The younger man seemed to brighten a little blue eyes glowing with momentary pride at the compliment. Thanks, old man. Saratobi nodded before making a shooing motion at the redhead. All right, go on then. We'll figure everything else out later. Get some sleep. And he reached into one drawer and withdrew a wallet, deactivating the seal with a flick of his hand before offering several bills. Buy some clothes and food. That should be enough for a month. And then you can start doing missions to earn your own money. Naruto eyed the bills before accepting them with a nod of thanks. I'll pay you back, old man. Saratobi would have refused if he wasn't certain Naruto would be stubborn about it. So he simply nodded in acknowledgement, deactivating the privacy seals as Naruto, now Haruki, sketched a simple salute before jumping out the window and disappearing over the rooftops within seconds. Hokage-sama. Saratobi glanced absently at his bodyguards as they slipped back into the office. He waved a dismissive hand in the air as he sat back down and started on a new stack of paperwork. One of my spies. He had to pull out quite suddenly though, so I was not expecting him. I sent him out a long time ago and haven't seen him in a while. He was also under a hinge and it took me a moment to realize who he was. Now I better start on this. I swear, the paperwork grows every time I turn around. The Unbu on guard duty seemed to accept this easily enough as they relaxed and moved back into the shadows again, some almost palpably amused at Saratobi's grumbling. But even as he started scanning a request for new medical equipment at the hospital, Saratobi contemplated the few things he had learned in the last 20 minutes. Dark times lay ahead, waiting in shadowed corners. But perhaps, with the time traveler's help, a man who seemed both familiar and foreign to him at the moment, they would somehow manage. They would have to. Sasuke. He fell back, horror twisting his heart as a familiar figure shoved him away, darting in front of the oncoming Chidori. Sasuke. No move. The raven-haired general glanced back a heartbeat before the attack struck, a smirk playing on the man's lips even as Sharingan eyes met Cerulean. And then blue-white lightning seemed to explode in front of them, engulfing the Uchiha as Madara's hand thrust clean through Sasuke's chest. Streaks of lightning spread outward like snakes, wrapping around arms and legs and twisting them to awkward angles. Through it all, he stayed frozen to the ground, breath frozen in his lungs as the lightning died and a broken body tilted backwards. He barely managed to pull enough brain cells together to catch the dead weight before the general hit the ground. Sasuke. His eyes drifted to the gaping bloody hole in the Uchiha's chest, seeing the damning injury and smelling the sickening scent of burnt flesh but not comprehending. This was Sasuke, his teammate, his rival, his best friend, his brother, and this was not supposed to happen. Don't you dare. Shocked blue eyes flickered back up to meet Dull Onyx the light inside them fading fast even as the Uchiha's gaze clung desperately to his. Don't you dare. Sasuke rasped again, crimson spilling from his mouth and staining his lips. Let him win. Naruto. And then he was gone, black eyes becoming sightless as the last spark of life spluttered and died, his entire body turning slack. He couldn't breathe, couldn't think, couldn't hear anything as he strained his ears in vain to catch the telltale breaths from the prone figure he was crouching over save for the harsh, raucous laughter of the man standing only steps away from them. He's gone now too, Naruto Kuen. Another one you led to his death. Another one you killed. When will you learn your lesson? It is futile to stand against me. This one's last of your pawns too, is he not? Or do you have another one to sacri dash? In the next moment, all he could hear was screaming, and he barely registered that the agonized sounds splitting the air were coming from his own throat as he hurtled at the mocking figure with a vengeance, insanity threatening to conquer his mind. Yet still, still he could hear the sound of mad laughter, cutting into him with terrifying accuracy because Madara was right, it was his fault, his fault again, and once more he had lost another of his precious people. Lost the last of whom he had sworn to protect. With a choked-off cry, Haruki shot up in his bed, 
momentarily disoriented and drenched in sweat as he gasped for breath. One shaky hand reached up to cover his eyes, mentally pushing the most recent of his former life's memories back. Sasuke had been the last of his friends to go, loyal and unwavering to the very end. That Sasuke was gone now, the one with whom he could banter with and spar with and be Naruto with, not Hokage, but there was another Sasuke he could still save, one that he now had a chance of giving a better life to. Breathing finally steadying, Haruki lowered his hand, dropping it back into his lap as he glanced at the plastic clock he had bought yesterday. 5.10 a.m. stared back at him, and the redhead could only sigh as he tossed back the blankets and got out of bed. Three hours of sleep was actually pretty good in his book so he wasn't complaining. A quick shower and a cup of ramen later and Haruki was on his way out the door, whisker markings hidden behind a hinge and his new weapons concealed on his body. He had gone on a shopping spree yesterday and had even managed to find a lightweight katana, one with an indigo hilt and a blade of tamahagane so strong that a hint shimmering blue flashed across the blade when wielded properly. The katana could channel elemental chakra, which was perfect for Haruki because most of his attacks with his old katana consisted of combining chakra with the sword. Haruki had bought it at Tintin's family store, and while he hadn't seen the future weapon's mistress, he had shaken hands with her father. The man had recommended this katana after listening to Haruki's detailed description of his former blade. Locking his apartment door behind him, Haruki turned in the direction of the village's front gates, only to stop and blink in mild surprise when he caught sight of familiar blue eyes staring inquisitively back up at him. Good morning, Haruki greeted his younger counterpart after a short, contemplative moment. While he was now living next door to the 12-year-old, he hadn't expected to have to interact with him until after he got back from Kumo. I believe I'm your new neighbor, Kazama Haruki. Nice to meet you. This seemed to snap the boy out of whatever fascinated trance he had been in. Amuzumaki Naruto. The blonde chirped brightly, but there was an undercurrent of uncertainty that Haruki easily detected, recognizing it from his own childhood whenever he had to force aside the fear of being rejected and hated so he could introduce himself. You're living next to me now? Haruki offered a faint half-smile to the genin. Yes. I just got back from a long-term mission. Naruto frowned as narrowing in suspicion. So you had to get a new apartment? It was an eight-year-long mission, Haruki clarified, suppressing another smile at the odd expression that spread across the blonde's face. Had he really been this open when he was a child? Having to keep up the rent on my old place would have been a waste of money, so I had to find a different place to live in now that I'm back. You must be really good for the old man to give you such a long mission, Naruto exclaimed, eyes lighting up with excitement. And you're living next to me. The blonde fell silent for a moment as he eyed Haruki's ninja garb. Are you going on another mission already? Haruki nodded, slipping his hands into the jounin vest he was currently wearing. An unbu had dropped off both the vest and a brand new hitai eight last night. Yes, but it's a top secret mission and I'll be back in five days so don't tell anyone, okay? If there was one thing Haruki knew his current self and his younger self would always share, it was the adamant refusal to break their word. When Naruto nodded seriously, Haruki knew the younger boy would take the information to his grave. With a satisfied nod, Haruki checked the sky, noting the rising sun before turning back to Naruto. I still have some time before I have to leave. Have you had breakfast yet? We could go get some ramen or something. As expected, Naruto immediately brightened at the mention of ramen, but deflated again almost immediately. I can't. I have to meet my new team at 6 for our test to become Jinin, and our sensei told us not to eat anything. Haruki considered this thoughtfully. Really, looking back, Kakashi could have at least let them eat, especially when the man was going to be late. Who is your sensei? Hitaki Kakashi. Naruto made a face. He's kinda weird. Haruki found himself grinning a little at this. Ah, I've heard of him. He's famous for being late to everything by at least two hours. You must have met him yesterday. Was he late? Naruto's eyes widened as he nodded vigorously. Yeah, he was over three hours late. Haruki sweat dropped. He had forgotten how long it took for Kakashi to pick them up the first time around. But even for the copy Nin, over three hours seemed a bit excessive. Then I don't think you have anything to worry about. I guarantee he won't meet up with you and your team for at least a few hours. A little breakfast now wouldn't hurt either. You'll have digested it all by the time he arrives anyway. Still, Naruto hesitated, shifting indecisively from foot to foot. But Sasuke team and Sakura-chan won't have anything to eat. Haruki smiled again in approval. How about this then? We still have some time before six so we can swing by Ichiraku's, pick up some ramen, and then you can take some back to your teammates. My treat, since you're keeping a secret for me. 
The blonde's eyes lit up again, obviously pleased by this suggestion. K. Thanks, Kazama-san. Haruki quirked an eyebrow as they began their trek to the ramen stand. Haruki is fine. Kazama-san makes me feel old. Although, he thought reflectively. I feel old either way. Haruki-san then. Naruto peered almost shyly up at him. You're being really nice. The redhead suppressed the faint stirring of anger welling up inside him. While he knew the blonde was simply him as a child, it felt worse this time around seeing the loneliness in someone who, technically, was another person. His younger counterpart very much reminded him of Yusuke at the moment. And thinking of Yusuke, Haruki would have to find a way to adopt him again, but that would have to wait, no matter how much he disliked the idea. Leaving a six-year-old alone in his apartment was hardly ideal. He would work on it when he came back. Can I be nice to a new friend? Haruki smiled gently down at the boy, who ducked his head and flushed red with embarrassment, but seemed equally pleased at the same time. The redhead decided at that very moment that this Naruto, who had already suffered 12 years as the Kanoa's pariah, would never know that pain and loneliness again, not while he was here. When he came back from Kumo, if he noticed so much as a glare from any of the villagers, he or she would be getting a taste, only a taste as he didn't think Saratobi would be very pleased with him if he did any real damage to any of them. No matter how much they would deserve it, as to why enemy Nin had all been ordered to flee on site if they ever laid eyes on him before he had even turned 18. By the time they had reached the ramen stand, Naruto had opened up and had gone through all the reasons for disliking Sasuke team, he's a jerk and an arrogant bastard, and he has the personality of a rock, as well as all the reasons for liking Sakura-chan. She's pretty and cute, and she has cool hair. Haruki only chuckled, absently surprised at the sound since he couldn't remember the last time he had openly shown amusement or shown amusement at all, for that matter. What would you like? Haruki eyed his wallet, wondering if he had promised, my treat, a bit too soon, but Naruto showed a commendable amount of restraint when he only listed three types of ramen. Could I have a miso ramen, a tonkatsu ramen for Sasuke, and a Tarinika ramen for Sakura-chan? Please. Haruki smiled and nodded, glancing up when Tuchi, and oh, the man was a sight for sore eyes. Both Tuchi and Ayam had died when Kanoha had been burned to the ground, but up until the very last moment, both father and daughter had carried on working, determined to give the Kanoha citizens some semblance of normalcy amidst the depression of war. Stepped out of the back of the shop, already smiling a greeting at the short blonde. Good morning, Naruto. You're up early. Naruto grinned brightly at the owner of the ramen stand. Morning, Tuchi-san. I have training with my Jin and team this morning, but I came by to pick up breakfast first. Realization dawned on Tuchi's face. That's right. You've been assigned to a Jin and team. Well, a young ninja can't go hungry. What would you like? While Naruto rattled off his orders, Haruki caught the older man's gaze as Tuchi gave him an assessing look. He could recall that both Tuchi and Ayam had been very protective of him, especially when he was younger, so the redhead figured he should probably put the man at ease. Kazama Haruki, Haruki offered once Naruto finished talking. Naruto Kuen's next door neighbor. Tuchi squinted at him. I haven't seen you around before. Naruto cut in before Haruki could reply. Haruki-san's been away for a long time. He just got back yesterday, and he's treating me to ramen as a welcoming present. Naruto blinked almost oolishly as he seemed to realize that welcoming presents were usually given to the person moving in, and Haruki chuckled again, not noticing the way Tuchi relaxed at the unexpectedly warm sound, nor the way Naruto stilled at it. A look of wonder lighting his eyes as if unable to believe that anyone could laugh like that in his presence. Yes, Haruki shrugged taking out a few bills to cover the ramen fee. I just moved in and met Narudokuin this morning. Since neither of us have had breakfast yet, a lie, and Haruki reflexively crossed his fingers behind his wallet, I thought we'd swing by for ramen. Please add another miso ramen to the order. Tuchi smiled again, waving a careless hand in the air as he started on the ramen. Half price on everything today. Consider it a welcome home present from me, Haruki-san. Haruki blinked and then nodded his thanks, placing the correct amount of money on the counter before taking the seat next to Naruto to wait. Haruki-san. The redhead glanced down at his younger counterpart, raising an eyebrow in question. The blonde squirmed in his seat, seemingly torn between two decisions before finally blurting out, Could you show me a jutsu? Haruki blinked at the request, taking in the puppy-like eagerness that was blatant on the blonde's face before nodding. As if he could refuse the blonde anything with a face like that. Besides, the boy reminded him far too much of his own Jin and team eight years ago. Those three had learned how to play him for a sucker way too quickly, 
not that he had tried particularly hard to stop them. Staring out at the quiet town, Haruki considered his jutsus before raising his hands and going through the proper seals, Futon, Goden Keitsa Hoshi no Mori. The blue swirl of wind chakra rushed around the street outside the stand, a gentle breeze compared to the maelstrom of wind Haruki was used to whipping up. Lances formed in the air at five equal points, surrounding one area before shooting forward. With a flick of his wrist, Haruki quickly dispelled it. Even holding back, a sizable hole would have formed in the ground, and he had no wish to do manual labor for the sand dame anytime soon. Turning back to Naruto, Haruki blinked at the awestruck expression on the blonde's face. That was so cool. Naruto gushed, nearly bouncing in his seat. You're really strong. Haruki found himself rubbing the back of his head in his habitual movement when embarrassed. It wasn't as if the jutsu had been any higher than a beer rank, and Naruto would one day be able to do it as well seeing as he had been the one to create it. It wasn't even all that impressive, but he supposed, to a jinin, it really was something to see. You'll be that strong one day too, Haruki answered firmly and watched in satisfaction as Naruto beamed up at him, obviously hearing the sincerity in the redhead's voice. It wasn't as if he was lying either, and the blonde seemed to realize this as he sat a little taller. Your ramen, Tuchi cut in, placing four steaming bowls in front of them. As Naruto quickly dug into his bowl, the ramen stand owner glanced at Haruki again, his gaze softer this time but also slightly puzzled. You seem somewhat familiar, the man finally voiced, and Haruki forced himself not to tense up. But I could swear I've never met you before. Haruki shrugged and said nothing plucking a napkin from the counter and handing it to his younger counterpart as the blonde inhaled his ramen before picking up two more bowls and waiting for Naruto to finish. Tichi shook his head, offering a warm smile. Never mind. Any friend of Naruto's is a friend of mine. Come back anytime. We're open the entire day. Haruki nodded silently, gaze sliding to Naruto as the boy finished up, shouted his thanks, and picked up the remaining bowl, Sasuke's with careful hands as he slid off his seat and joined Haruki as he ducked out of the shop. Tuchi waved them out with a smile, one which Naruto answered with a grin of his own before the two set out towards the bridge. Haruki barely remembered to let Naruto lead, as he wasn't supposed to know where they were going. Soon, black and pink caught their attention and Naruto quickly shouted out a greeting. Sasuke only cast the blonde a disinterested look before glancing at Haruki, black eyes assessing, and Haruki felt his heart twist painfully in his chest. He quickly turned his gaze to the last genin of Team 7, watching as she scowled in Naruto's direction but directed a curious look at him. Again, the wide green eyes sent a rush of memories through his mind, some good, some bad, and all of them painful. He finally settled for keeping his eyes on his blonde companion. Somehow, that hurt less. Hey Sakura-chan, Sasuke team. I brought you food. Baka. Sakura immediately snapped, swatting at the blonde. You're late, and we're not supposed to eat. Naruto pouted and rubbed his head. But Kakashi Sensei is going to be late anyway, and a small breakfast won't hurt. Besides, Haruki san says it's okay. Haruki almost sweat dropped when three pairs of eyes turned on him. Technically, he hadn't said it was okay, per se, but he supposed he had implied it, which meant he now had to take responsibility for his words. With an inward sigh, Haruki nodded cautiously. Training with nothing in your stomach is dangerous for you. A small meal wouldn't hurt, and your sensei will be late anyway. You'll have digested everything by the time he gets here. See? Naruto thrust the ramen bowl he had been holding in Sasuke's direction, taking the boy off guard and somehow managing to dump the bowl into the Uchiha's hands. Eat it. Before it gets cold. Sasuke barely spared the blonde a glance before directing his cool gaze at Haruki. Who are you? He asked bluntly, his words falling just short of rude. Haruki, now more than used to Sasuke's personality, replied without being offended while Naruto scowled at the raven-haired boy, Kazama Haruki, Naruto Kuen's next-door neighbor. I met up with him this morning and thought some breakfast would help keep your strength up today. Sasuke said nothing more but, after a moment of consideration and a quick scan of Haruki's jown and vest, dug into his breakfast, nodding curtly at both him and Naruto. Haruki turned his gaze on the pink-haired Kunoichi next and offered the Tarinika ramen for the girl. Sakura blushed, ducking her head shyly as she glanced at Sasuke before replying uncertainly, I'm on a diet. Haruki tilted his head contemplatively. He had forgotten that the Sakura at this age was much more, well, girl than Kunoichi. It won't hurt, he assured after a moment, searching for the right words to convince her. Sakura liked books and facts so Haruki would use that. 
You need a well-rounded diet to get a good figure, and that includes carbohydrates. As a kunoichi, you'll burn off anything you don't need when you train later. Not eating or only eating certain foods is bad for your body in the long run. Sakura's cheeks darkened as she glanced hesitantly at him. You sure? Haruki allowed a small smile to curve his lips as he extended the bowl again. I'm sure. Mere seconds later, Haruki had Sakura eating her breakfast as well and he turned to the blonde still standing at his side, now eyeing his teammates ramen enviously. The redhead smothered his amusement and extended his own bowl instead. I can pick up my own breakfast later, Naruto Kuen. Growing boys need food. Naruto only hesitated for a brief moment before flashing a grateful smile up at him and accepting the bowl, digging in with little fanfare. Haruki nodded in satisfaction before glancing up at the sky. I should get going. Things to do. A bit of advice though. Do a bit of a warm-up after you finish eating. It'll help digestion. He directed another smile in Sakura's direction who promptly blushed. And it'll loosen your muscles when you're running around later. And later, during your test, and even after that. Try not to think too individually. You're a team now, and your teammates are what will make you strong. Haruki carefully kept his gaze focused on all three of them, not singling anyone out. Sasuke would get defensive otherwise. It's a testament to your own strength if you can see the strengths in other people and learn to work with them. Letting your teammates down because of pride or arrogance means you are just as weak as those who don't have enough physical strength. Weaker, because you have no excuse. All three nodded. Even Sasuke, who seemed surprisingly at ease in Haruki's presence, reminding the redhead of his Sasuke, the one who had been happy with himself and content with the people around him. They looked somewhat puzzled at his last hint, and Sasuke frowned a little at the mention of pride being a weakness, but none of them questioned him further. Haruki hoped it would be enough to get the Uchiha thinking. He knew how the adult Sasuke thought, knew what buttons to push to encourage the part of Sasuke that would one day grow up to be a great man, but he could only start the ball rolling now and give a hand to the boy now and then. The rest would be up to the future Unbu general. Naruto paused from his eating, voicing a question that bordered on insecurity. I'll see you later? Haruki smiled at the blonde's tact as he nodded, reaching out absently to ruffle his younger counterpart's bright hair as he stared down into inquisitive blue eyes. Of course. Good luck on your test, duckling. Naruto blinked, obviously startled, though it was a toss-up as to who was more so, the blonde or Haruki. Duckling? The redhead found himself rubbing the back of his head again, repressing the embarrassment threatening to show on his face. Ah, you reminded me of my old Jin and team for a moment. Short and small end. Well? My apologies. Naruto seemed to consider this for a moment, pouting most likely at the short and small part before flashing an almost pleased grin up at Haruki. It's okay. I don't mind. Haruki raised his eyebrows but said nothing more, nodding a farewell to the blonde before doing the same to the other two. Without another word, the redhead quickly hurried away. He had planned to start out earlier, but he hadn't taken lingering with the rest of Team 7 to give them health advice into account. No matter. Five days was plenty to get to Kumo and back if he kept moving. Yo. All three Team 7 soon-to-be Jinin members turned various expressions of murder on the silver-haired Jounin in front of them. You're late. Both Naruto and Sakura accused, while even Sasuke glared daggers at the masked Nin. Kakashi just eye smiled at them. Sorry, sorry, I got lost on the road of life, dash. Liar. Naruto and Sakura chimed again, scowling fiercely at the Jounin. Kakashi shrugged carelessly, eyes flickering briefly to the nearby trash can and noting the three bowls of ramen. Ma, ready for your test? Naruto pouted as he eyed the lunchbox in each of his teammates' hands. He wriggled from his position, struggling with the ropes holding him to the tree stump. His stomach suddenly growled, breaking the silence, and the blonde promptly scowled, ducking his head as both his teammates glanced at him. He jerked a little when a bento box appeared in his line of sight and, following the hand that held it, Naruto blinked in confusion as he found himself staring into Onyx. Sasuke only frowned a little, extending some tempura in the blonde's direction. Eat. Sasuke snapped gruffly. You got us breakfast earlier. I'm just paying you back. Naruto gaped before grinning widely and accepting the food. He almost choked on it when another bento was thrust into his face, a red-faced Sakura scowling at him. Just this once. The kunoichi snapped, offering one of the rice balls from her lunch. And it isn't as if you bought us breakfast. But like Haruki-san said, you'll be useless if you don't eat something. Naruto grinned again, features bright. Thanks Sakura-chan, Sasuke team. Sasuke just rolled his eyes. HN, just hurry up Dobe, before Sensei gets back. 
Naruto quickly swallowed the rice ball, smiling continually for a moment before his eyes widened, watching as a strong wind rolled in and the sky darkened. Kakashi appeared, staring forebodingly at them as the ground shook. You three. He barked, looming over them. Sasuke, Sakura, I told you not to feed him. What have you got to say for yourselves? Sasuke only glared right back, chin tilted up defiantly as he unconsciously shifted to place Naruto further behind him. Beside him, Sakura had flushed and her eyes were wide with alarm, but her shoulders squared as if preparing for battle and her gaze never wavered from the copy knee. Behind both of them, Naruto scowled at Kakashi, blue eyes narrowed. This was his team, damn it. They had gone to bat for him. He couldn't let them take the fall. We're a team. Naruto glared fiercely as their sensei's gaze turned on him. Don't just single them out. Besides, I'm the one who ate the food. Shut up, dope. Sasuke tossed a dark look over his shoulder at the blonde. I offered when you were already hungry. It's not just your fault. Sakura scrambled closer to her two teammates, elbowing the tied-up Jinin roughly. Yeah, I chose to feed you too. Stop trying to act tough. It makes you look stupid. All three turned back to their sensei as Kakashi came even closer, visible eye unreadable. If that's how you three, then I have no choice but to pass you. A stunned silence fell over the three Jinin as their surroundings returned tomorrow and Kakashi I smiled at them again, crouching down to their level. You three are the first team I've ever passed, he told them cheerfully. You stuck up for one another instead of just listening to me. His eye turned somber, studying them with careful consideration. You have to remember, in the world of ninjas, those who break the rules are scum, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than scum. All three Jinin were quiet for a moment taking this in as Haruki's last piece of advice came back to them. They glanced at each other. How had the redhead known? Well, Kakashi continued in a lighter tone, rising and stuffing his hands into his pockets. Team 7 will start missions tomorrow. Meet at the bridge at 6. With a poof, the copy name disappeared and, unbeknownst to the newly formed Team 7, reappeared in a tree nearby, observing them with a steady eye. Below, Sasuke rose to his feet. Dusting himself off as Sakura quickly packed up the lunches and placed them by the stump. Kakashi would probably come back for them later. Both of them turned to stare at the blonde of their team before Sasuke finally heaved a sigh and took out a kanai, cutting the ropes with quick efficiency. Adobe, Sasuke voiced, idly twirling his kanai as Naruto landed on his feet and stretched out his limbs. Who is your neighbor? How did he know Kakashi Sensei's test would be based on teamwork? Naruto shrugged sheepishly as even Sakura focused on him with curious attentiveness. I dunno. He just moved in next to me. He just returned from an eight-year-long mission and needed a new place to live. And he knew Kakashi Sensei was going to be late, which was why he offered to buy us breakfast. Just like that. Sakura questioned, looking puzzled. I mean, he doesn't really know us, does he? And he's a jounin. Why would he bother with a bunch of jinin? Naruto shrugged again, one hand reaching up to rub the back of his head. I don't know, but... Dobe, stop. Sasuke suddenly ordered, and Naruto instinctively froze as even Sakura was blinking at him with a startled expression on her face. Sasuke studied the smaller boy with careful consideration before murmuring, he did the exact same thing. Air, did what? Naruto glanced nervously between his two teammates. Can I put my arm down now? Sakura quickly nodded, but didn't look away as Naruto dropped his arm back to his side. Naruto, she said in a hushed voice. Are you sure you don't know him? Haruki-san rubbed his head like that too. Naruto tilted his head in confusion. Lots of people do that, don't they? I mean I'm sure I'm not the only one. Sasuke and Sakura actually exchanged a look before turning back to the blonde. Yeah, Sasuke agreed carefully. But the way he does it just gives off the same. He trailed off, eyes flickering away as he seemed to realize he was taking far too much interest in something unrelated to his training. Sakura quickly picked up the train of thought from her crush though. It gives off the same feel, she tried to explain. I mean, when Haruki-san did it earlier, the action seemed really familiar to me but I didn't make the connection until I saw you do it now. You always rub your head like that. Naruto frowned but dropped any suspicions easily enough. Well I've never met him before but I think he's nice. And I don't think he was faking any of it either. I mean, even Sasuke team listened to him without pretending not to. Sasuke which before tucking his kanai away and turning in the direction of his home. HN, whatever. I'm leaving. Do us all a favor dope, and don't get tied to any more tree stumps. And just like that, everything went back to normal as Sakura rushed after the raven-haired Jinin asking for a date with a rising blush in her face, 
and Naruto scowled after them and went on his own way, deciding to head to Aruka's apartment first to tell the man the good news. Still hidden in the shadows of the nearby tree, Kakashi ran an absent hand through his hair. Interesting. Someone in Kanoha knew of his tardiness and, more importantly, his tests. Someone who had been away from Kanoha for the past eight years. Last time he checked, he hadn't been a sensei eight years ago. He paused to consider this. Surely the Sandam would be willing to tell him something about this Haruki. He checked the sun's position and, deeming himself a sufficient three hours late for reporting back to the Hokage, disappeared in a puff of smoke. Late, Kakashi. I don't even know why I bother anymore. Kakashi I smiled at the Hokage before whipping out his newest Ika Ika Paradise book. Around him, several of the other Jounin twitched and Kareen I looked ready to deck him. The Hokage just sighed and waved a dismissive hand in the air. All right, now that we're finally all here, tell me whether you passed your teams or not. Team 1. Pass. Team 2. Pass. Team 3. Fail. Team 4. Pass. Team 5. Fail. Team 6. Fail. Team 7. Pass. Dead silence met this announcement as all the present Jown in turn to stare dubiously at the copy knee. Kakashi glanced up from his book, I scanning the room lazily and a faint smirk became visible behind his mask. The Hokage only shook his head, a small smile curving his lips as he marked the answer down. He hadn't expected anything less, seeing as Haruki had given no indication that his younger counterpart would fail, but it was still shocking for Kakashi to actually pass a team. Team 8. Pass. Team 9. Fail. In Team 10. Pass. Saratobi nodded his approval. The new batch of Jinin seemed to show promise. Very well, missions for your Jinin teams will start tomorrow. Dismissed. The Jounins piled out of the office, some shooting curious glances at Kakashi as the copy Nin made no move to leave. Kakashi, Saratobi started, some idea of what the man wanted already forming in his mind. Can I help you with something? Kakashi straightened, tucking his book away as he made sure the office door was shut before turning to the Hokage. Ma, I came across something interesting today. Oh, yes, a man named Haruki. I only got his first name. My students were talking about him. A Jounin recently returning from an eight-year-long mission who knows how my tests work. Saratobi forced down the urge to show his amusement, carefully keeping his face neutral as he studied the curiosity flashing in Kakashi's visible eye. You must mean Kazama Haruki. Saratobi offered, watching the faint frown pass over the Jounin's brow. He just returned yesterday from an infiltration mission. He's good at what he does. Getting information on you wouldn't be too hard for him. Kakashi nodded slowly but added bluntly, I've never heard of him. Saratobi shrugged nonchalantly. You were unbu eight years ago, Kakashi. And I didn't exactly announce his mission to the village. He's a quiet man. You might have missed him. Kakashi nodded again. Do you know where he is now? Around. Saratobi voiced vaguely. I've given him some vacation time. He deserves it. Planning to interrogate him yourself? Kakashi had the decency to look sheepish. Just curious, Hokage-sama. My kids seem quite taken with him. Besides, if he's a fellow Jounin, I'd like to get to know him. Air, what does he look like? Saratobi chuckled. Look for red hair. You can't miss him. Once he returns, of course. He added mentally. Kakashi nodded his thanks, sketching a quick salute before disappearing in a swirl of leaves. Saratobi stared disapprovingly at the pile of foliage now in his office. Really? Couldn't they just use the door? It was there for a reason. A figure slipped unseen over the wall surrounding the shrine, passing by the lax guards placed at the entrance. Red hair tucked neatly away, the black-clad Neen quickly sped into the interior of the shrine, pausing only long enough to deactivate the simple seals placed around the small building housing the body of Hyuga Hizashi. For someone as hated as the Hyuga clan head's brother, the man really did get quite a resting place. Haruki supposed this had more to do with the fact that they simply wanted to flaunt the fact that they had Hizashi's body while ignoring the fact that they had failed to get their hands on Hyuga Hayashi. Either way, while the shrine was simple enough, the place was also built quite elegantly, trees planted on either side of the shrine with statues lined up on either side of the path. The red paint coloring the roof was well maintained as well, and the grass surrounding the shrine was well kept. No torches were lit inside the shrine which made Haruki's work that much easier. Reaching the dust-covered coffin in which Hizashi had been laid out, Haruki noted the somewhat complex seal on the lid. He frowned. This was not the seal he had come across in his former life. That seal had just been placed on the coffin for keeping the corpse from decomposing. A simple enough seal. This one. Haruki leaned in closer, 
studying the symbols that made up the seal. When he had retrieved Hizashi's body with Niji in the other timeline, he had been 19, seven years from now in this current timeline. Why would the seal on a dead body be different between the two times? His eyes suddenly focused on the center of the seal, a swirl of symbols that defined suspended life. Suspended life? The only reason that would be here. With a mental curse, Haruki silently pulled out a piece of paper, ink, and a brush. He really, really hoped this wasn't what he thought it was. He had worked with life suspension seals before, having come across them when going through Sassari's heart container. He knew how to counter it. A few minutes later, he slapped the counter seal on top of the coffin. A brief flash of chakra lit the coffin lid before the ink on both seals disappeared. Quietly, Haruki lifted the lid of the coffin, putting it aside carefully before taking a deep breath and looking inside. He stared. It was official. Someone up there seriously hated him. Impassively, he watched the gentle rise and fall of Hyuga Hizashi's chest as his mind raced at this new turn of events. The man had clearly been dead when he and Niji had gone to fetch the body. Clearly. Which meant Kumo or someone else had killed the man sometime before Haruki had turned 19. He leaned closer and noted the familiar thin scar marring the man's throat, a calculated cut for murdering prisoners. Obviously, they had planned on killing him. Someone had figured out what the Hyuga's cursed seal would do once the man was dead. Someone else had then managed to save him, and then had Hizashi preserved until they could figure out how to break the cursed seal. Naruto scoffed. He had figured that out by the time he had turned 16. Apparently, one had a lot of free time on their hands when infiltrating enemy countries. He had spent an entire year in IWA and had managed to figure out both the caged bird seal and Orochimaru's cursed seal. Not bad for a 15-year-old. But right now, none of those thoughts helped. On one hand, if he didn't take Hyuga Hizashi's body back, he would have a guilty conscience for not getting the poor man out while he was still alive. The Hyuga clan would be up in arms if they ever found out. Niji would probably want his head on a silver platter if the same thing happened, and he would have no proof of his spying in Kumo for the council, but, and it was one hell of a but. Nothing unexpected would happen in this timeline if he stuck to his plan and retrieved a dead Hyuga. Hizashi, and not a live one. On the other hand, if he did take Hyuga Hizashi's body back, he would be guilt-free, and Kami knew how much guilt he already had on his shoulders, he didn't need any more. The Hyuga clan would be indebted to him for forever and a day. Niji would have his father back, and he would have sufficient proof for the council, but, and there was a shitload of buts this time, the Hyuga clan would never keep quiet about something like this. He had no idea how the Sandame wanted to play this. Kanaha Gakur would probably regain an age-old enemy out of Kumo before the week was out. Another war would start, his purpose for coming back would become null and void, and the timeline would be completely messed up. It would be unbelievable what the difference between a dead man and a live one could make if it wasn't currently staring him in the face. Literally. Kami, he wasn't even being paid for this. Haruki grimaced, closing his eyes briefly and pinching the bridge of his nose as he debated on his next action. Given his two choices, the logical one would be the first. There was a whole lot less that could go wrong. His mind said option one. Too bad his heart said option two. He breathed deeply, staring down at the Komodos Hyuga again. Niji had once told him a little about his father during one of the rare lulls in the war, when it had just been the two of them holed up in one of the shabby tents set up on the battlefield. Niji had told him how his father had been quite bitter with the main house because of the caged bird seal. But he had later learned from Hayashi that, while he had been angry about this, his father had also taken Hayashi's place during the Hyuga affair of his own free will, having forcefully stopped Hayashi from refusing his decision. To Naruto, Hyuga Hizashi seemed like a good man, and Naruto knew all about how angry one could get over having a seal put on oneself without consent. Haruki sighed and straightened, quickly drawing up another life suspension seal and unsealing the body clone he had brought along to replace Hizashi. In the end, he was just stalling for time. He had known, from the moment he had realized that the man was still alive, that he would not be leaving without his former, future, second in command's father. Besides, he doubted the Kumo Shinobi came regularly to check up on someone the rest of the world thought was dead. With a little chakra manipulation, the body clone was now an exact replica of Hyuga Hizashi, down to the scar running across his throat, with the exception of the no breathing part. Gently, Haruki lifted Hizashi from the coffin with minimal difficulty making sure the simple kimono he was wearing didn't catch on anything and carefully placing the man on the ground against a nearby pillar. While the seal had kept the man alive without food or water, 
Seals like that also didn't work forever, and the seal's recipient's health would decline over time. Hizashi was already too thin. From there, the redhead quickly replaced Hizashi with the body clone, shutting the coffin again and activating the new life suspension seal. The body inside the coffin would still be unanimated since it had never been alive in the first place, but the seal would look like it was working at the very least. Clearing up any evidence of his presence from the shrine and brushing away the few fingerprints he had imprinted on the coffin, Haruki scanned the room one last time before scooping up the Hyuga clan head's brother and slipping out of the shrine. Again, leaving the shrine was just as easy as getting in, even with an extra burden. Stopping once he reached the mountain pass that would eventually lead him back to Kanoha, Haruki paused to consider his options. He couldn't seal the man into a scroll and he really didn't want to use his space-time ninjutsu with a physically fragile man in tow. Haruki scowled. This seriously put a wrench in his plans. He had been planning on flashing back to the Kanoha gates to cut down travel time, getting him back to the village in the promised five days. But now, with a little over a day to get back. Karama, you awake. Silence, and then a low grumbling growl reverberated in his mind as the fox yawned. What do you want, kid? I need a lift back to Kanoha. Got an unexpected passenger. Haruki felt the QB stir in his mindscape. Isn't that human supposed to be dead? The redhead sighed gloomily. I feel like an ass for thinking this, but things would be so much simpler if he was. The demon fox snorted, and then a bright flash of red glowed briefly beside Haruki, and Karama appeared beside him, stretching languidly as he waved his nine tails behind him. Hop on, Kit. The QB turned one intelligent purple eye on Haruki. I'll get you home on time. Naruto smiled gratefully before clambering on, settling Hizashi in front of him to make sure the man didn't fall off along the way. Riding Karama was a lot like flying during a storm after all. Kakashi found himself with a slight tick over one eye when his Jin and team managed to find Tora in record-breaking time. Again. And the record they had broken was their own. From three days ago. He had no idea what had happened to his team. What had happened to the fangirl and the Avenger and the Deadlast. Ever since the Jin and test, the three seemed to have clicked and Kakashi couldn't be happier that his students were now working well together. Better than he could have ever hoped for but changes like the ones he had observed didn't happen for no reason. While Naruto and Sasuke still argued and Sakura was still violent prone towards the hyperactive blonde, all three seemed content enough to put aside their differences. Or at least work with their differences enough to complete all the D-rank missions Kakashi had thrown at them. Whatever the mysterious Haruki had told them before he had arrived the day of the Jin and test seemed to have stuck with them, and even Sasuke, the so-called Avenger and loner of the group, seemed to have put serious consideration in what they had heard. But it wasn't even the fact that some other Jounin had managed to inspire them to work together, and not Kakashi that irked the Kapinin so much, it was the fact that he couldn't find the man. He was an ex-umbo captain for Kami's sake. How hard could it be to find one red-haired Jounin in his own village? And worst of all, he had even gone back to the Sandame to ask for the redhead's whereabouts. Only to be told that what Haruki did in his own time was his business and Saratobi was not going to drag the man back to work just because Kakashi was dying of equal parts curiosity and paranoia. For the rest of his life, Kakashi would swear blind that his Hokage had been silently laughing at him the entire time. With a hidden grimace as Naruto bounced up to him, Tora in his somewhat scratched hands and Sakura and Sasuke coming up behind him, Kakashi sighed and nodded. All right, good job. Naruto, let Sakura and Sasuke take the cat back to the daimyo's wife. Before any of them could ask why, the Kapinin quickly doled out a half-lie. You returned the cat last time. I want Sakura and Sasuke to do it this time. Make sure to be polite. No matter what happens, understand. Sakura nodded quickly enough, happy to spend more time with Sasuke, and took Tora from Naruto. But Sasuke shot him a searching look before glancing at Naruto, I speculative even as he turned away. That was another difference. Whatever Haruki had said, Sasuke now seemed to study his two teammates more seriously, and, on several occasions, had already made use of Naruto's Kage Bunshins the Uchiha had half-suggested. Half-ordered Naruto to send his Bunshins to scope out the terrain when Kakashi had set up an obstacle course for them, and then had Naruto disperse them and relate back to the team what traps the Kapi Nin had managed to set up, and had also gotten Sakura, with her knowledge of theory and facts to teach. Naruto whenever the blonde couldn't quite understand something Kakashi was teaching them. Sometimes, even Sasuke would listen in, his face carefully blank and turned away but a telltale glint of concentration in his eyes nonetheless. The Uchiha prodigy was cataloging his team's strengths and weaknesses and utilizing them accordingly. 
Kakashi knew Chunin and even Jounin who couldn't do what Sasuke was learning to do. And it wasn't just Sasuke either. Sakura and Naruto had also changed a little. Sakura, though still obviously crushing on Sasuke, seemed better able to concentrate now that the Uchiha was not completely ignoring the pink-haired Kunoichi. She was now eating more too, even though the file Kakashi had received from the Hokage had mentioned that the girl was on a diet that leaned towards unhealthy. In addition to that, the regular, civil interactions she had with Naruto when Sasuke asked her to explain something to the blonde seemed to gain her some toleration towards Naruto as well. Naruto, on the other hand, was still just as cheerful, but the confidence that had seemed somewhat forced when Kakashi had first met him on the roof now appeared more genuine. It showed in the way the blonde walked through the streets as the civilians threw in dirty looks and whispered behind his back. Sakura and Sasuke had both picked up on this and would always make sure that the blonde walked between them, though Kakashi wasn't sure if this was done unconsciously or not. In turn, Naruto held his head a little higher and his grins were a little more real the sunny smile sometimes causing a slight pain in his chest for reasons he wasn't sure of, though that was slowly fading and being replaced by fondness for his bright-haired student. Naruto was also surprisingly gracious when he couldn't do something that his teammates could, as he had seen during the few obstacle courses he had set up one day. Even Sasuke would try something himself and only turn to Naruto or Sakura when he had frustrated himself in trying to do something he obviously couldn't without help. Naruto instinctively trusted his teammates to take care of themselves in the areas they were good at and back them up when they couldn't. Kakashi could actually see the beginnings of what could be an amazing team a decade from now. They were still rough around the edges though, still mere children, and far from skilled enough to pull off any real missions outside of the village no matter how well they worked together, not to mention that they still fought a little too much. Though Kakashi couldn't actually see that ever going away. But he could see it. If he squinted and looked hard enough maybe turn his head a little to the left and tilted it at just the right angle under the mid-afternoon sun, he could make out what they could eventually become. While Sakura was the voice of reason on Naruto's left and Sasuke the shadow guard on the blonde Jinchuriki's right, Naruto would be their center, bright and shining, and suddenly, in the rare fascinating times Kakashi could see all this. Naruto's dream of becoming Hokage didn't seem all that impossible anymore. Of course, then Naruto would do something stupid. Sakura would slap him upside the head, and Sasuke would roll his eyes and heave a put upon Sayat having been stuck on Team 7, and then Kakashi would blink and wonder if he had gone temporarily insane. But all this, all these changes, in less than a week. Kakashi's curiosity had kept his Jin and team out for training for more than the allotted half a day, but none of them seemed to really mind and Kakashi had managed to learn more about his team this way. It was seriously throwing a wrench in his lifestyle. He wasn't even late by more than an hour anymore, sometimes even less, and, while he usually had his book out in front of him, more often than not, he was observing his team instead. Which brought him back to the fact that he still couldn't find the man responsible. Kakashi had even dropped by Naruto's apartment building at odd times, though only in passing since waiting for the man outside his apartment was borderline creepy, even for him, and the copy Nin had drawn the line at outright stalking. But since the Sandame wasn't inclined to help him and his fellow Jounins were worse than useless since none of them seemed to know Kazama Haruki, Kakashi was now stooping down to drill his blonde student. Surely Naruto, who lived next to the man, could give him a hand. In some part of his mind that Kakashi was adept at ignoring since he had more than his fair share of odd quirks. A voice was cheerfully informing him that his so-called curiosity was quickly becoming an unhealthy obsession and that perhaps he should head over to the hospital for a mental checkup. Like everything else that voice told him, Kakashi ignored it. Naruto, Kakashi started casually. Do you know where Kazama-san is? He wasn't sure how old the red-haired Jounin was, but Saratobi talked about Haruki the same way he talked to Kakashi, so the copy Nin assumed they were at least around the same age. Somewhere around, I guess. Haruki-san is kinda quiet, so he probably likes spending some time alone. Blue eyes blinked innocently up at him throughout the blonde's answer. Kakashi was instantly suspicious. For one, he had seen the Hokage himself fold like wet paper when Naruto batted those eyes at him. And for another, Naruto had said almost the exact same thing the Hokage had told him on more than one occasion. Really, Kakashi crossed his arms. He supposed it wasn't really fair to seem intimidating, but it wasn't as if it actually worked. All three of his jinin seemed immune to his posturing after that first day. But Naruto only grinned up at him, an excited gleam entering his eyes as he almost bounced on the spot. Really? You can even stop by our apartment building tonight. You'll probably see him then. I can introduce you. Kakashi blinked. 
This was not what he had been expecting. Naruto was actually giving him a time when the redhead would actually be present. Maybe you should have asked the blonde earlier? Well, okay then, Kakashi quickly eye smiled at his student and whipped out his book to hide his sudden confusion. He was sure he was missing something here. I'll swing by at around 8, okay? Naruto nodded before waving goodbye and bouncing off in the direction of his favorite ramen stand. Kakashi sighed and almost slapped himself with his book. Seriously, he felt like he was completely out of the loop here. But he wanted to meet this Kazama Haruki. He wanted to know what kind of man could influence a bunch of kids so much with only a few choice words. Thanks for the lift, Karama. I can take it from here. The demon fox nodded distractedly, eyeing the village they could just see beyond a thick crop of trees. I don't see it, the QB finally decided. I have no idea what you see in that village. Humans. Emotional lot, all of you. And with that said, the fox disappeared with a swish of his tails, reappearing in Haruki's mindscape and promptly settling down for another nap. Haruki huffed in amusement but paid the fox no mind. A demon just didn't see things the same way humans did. Adjusting his grip on Hyuga Hizashi, Haruki quickly summoned a small yellow fox without using seals. Go to Saratobi-sama. He ordered. Tell him that I've finished, but some complications have risen, and I need a private audience. Tell him to use the seal once his office is cleared. The fox dipped her head in acknowledgement before loping off in the direction of the village. Mere minutes later, Haruki felt a faint tug in his mind, and he stepped without hesitation to the Sandame's location, tightening his hold on his ashi. A shorter distance was better when he traveled with an unconscious person in tow. Appearing in the office, Haruki looked up to find a frozen Saratobi staring at the man Haruki was carrying with deceiving placidity. Several seconds ticked by, and the redhead waited patiently for the Sandame to pull himself together. Oh dear, Saratobi finally managed faintly. Haruki snorted, glancing around and walking over to the couch in the side office to put Izashi down. Yeah, understatement old man. Saratobi sighed, walking over to stand beside him. This really is Hyuga Izashi? Yup. Haruki pulled off the bandana that had kept his hair out of sight. Startled the hell out of me too. In my time, Niji and I went to get him, and he was very much dead, but I was 19 at the time. The seal from that time was different too. It was just a body stasis seal. The seal I came across yesterday was a life suspension seal. And you managed to break it? A note of amazement rang in the older Hokage's voice. Haruki smirked just a little, a thrum of pride warming his heart. I'm a Fuinjutsu master, old man. I'm better than Rea. Saratobi smiled warmly up at him, noticeable pride glowing on the old man's features and Naruto found himself smiling back just a little. This man's opinion had always been important to him, even after he had died. So what should we do now? Haruki cleared his throat a little, stepping away. He wasn't too used to private emotional moments and too much time actually part of one made him uncomfortable. Saratobi hummed thoughtfully, tactfully ignoring the slightly embarrassed shift in Haruki's expression. Well, the Hyuga clan will have to be notified. You replaced Hizashi-san with the clone? Haruki inclined his head, arms crossed in front of him. I did and I replaced the life suspension seal as well. So long as no one opens the coffin and examines it too closely, the switch should go by unnoticed. At least until one of those Kumonines get it into their heads that they might know how to get rid of the caged bird seal without killing the man and the rakage lets them. Saratobi shot him a speculative glance. Do you? Haruki smiled thinly. I can get rid of any seal, old man. The Sandame's eyes widened. Even Orochimaru's cursed seal? Haruki's face darkened especially Orochimaru's cursed seal. Saratobi stared for a moment longer before shaking his head fondly. You've grown up well, Haruki Kuen. Haruki shrugged. Circumstances, old man. Circumstances and necessity. The Hokage only nodded this time, understanding without asking. Well, we won't be able to keep this a secret for very long. Kumo only asked for Hayashi-san's body though, and then eventually settled for Hizashi-san's body. There were no terms for a prisoner. We could use that to our advantage. War, old man, Haruki reminded, running a hand over tired eyes. We don't want war. Saratobi nodded in agreement, as briefly showing concern at the desolation in the redhead's voice. Of course not. We would need some legitimate way to place Hizashi-san back in Kanoha without alerting them to the fact that Kanoha managed to send someone into Kumo for his body. Haruki absently unsealed his Jounin vest from a scroll and tugged it on, as distant as his mind recalled all those strategy sessions he and Shikamaro had sat through, suggesting tactic after tactic, building on them, perfecting them. 
An idea formed in his mind and Haruki looked back at Saratobi who, to his credit, had stayed patiently silent as Haruki took a trip down memory lane. Ah. Haruki rubbed the back of his head. Sorry. I have an idea. What if we say that the life suspension seal had been weakened with time? The coffin was covered in dust so it's obvious no one's poked around there for a while. We could say that Hazashi-san managed to escape because the seal's hold on him slipped enough for him to get out. I could go back to Kumo and blow the shrine sky high. I'll leave some evidence of a faded life suspension seal lying in the wreckage before making my way back to Kanoha. We could say Hazashi-san blew up the place. I mean a disoriented man waking up inside a box is hardly ideal for anyone. He would try to get himself out and he could claim temporary selective memory loss. The mountains in Kaminari no Kuni are distinctive and he would have realized where he was and, not remembering much of anything, immediately set out for home. That could place him in Kanoha without us ever having to lift a finger. Kanoha finds out, the shit hits the fan, and Kumo has no room for deniability this time around. You said so yourself. A prisoner was not the deal we made with Kumo. We get Izashi-san back, Kumo can't declare war on us, and we'll have total control of the entire situation. This will also solve the problem between me and the council. In my time, it took a while to find out where Hizashi-san's body was hidden. Eight years in Kumo is sufficient time to find out, and long enough for a less-than-average seal's power to decline enough for someone to break through. Dead silence met him as Haruki finished, and the redhead blinked at the almost slack expression on Saratobi's face. The man looked slightly dumbfounded and seemed to be trying to find the right words. Luckily, another voice cut in before Haruki started worrying about shock. I agree with this plan. The voice came from the couch and both of them started, snapping their heads to stare into distinctive Byakugan eyes. Hizashi's voice had been gravelly with misuse, but still steady as he gazed straight at Haruki. Haruki froze, immediately wondering how long the man had been awake. He had been stupid. All ninjas were trained to be able to go from unconscious to conscious without any visible signs. He should have made sure. Haruki-san, was it? Haruki tensed under the Hyuga's contemplative gaze. How long have you been awake? He asked stiffly. Hizashi slowly shifted into a sitting position. Long enough to gather that you seem to be at least acquaintances with a version of my son old enough to infiltrate Kumogakure. An uncomfortable silence settled over the three of them and Haruki idly wondered if he could whack the Hyuga over the head hard enough to actually give him memory loss. Then again, he doubted the Hokage would be very happy about it. I will not pursue this issue any further, Hizashi suddenly interrupted his thoughts. Nor will I repeat anything I have heard today to anyone else. It is the very least I can do for the man who seems to have saved my life. Haruki blinked at this unexpected turn, studying Hizashi's face for any sign of deceit before glancing at Saratobi. The Sandame was smiling faintly. It seemed neither of them believed the Hyuga to be lying. Haruki grunted and shrugged backing away into the comfort of the shadows before moving into the side kitchen and out of sight of the other two occupants of the office. He had gotten used to staying hidden whenever he could back during the war. The habit would probably never leave him. Well then, moving on, Saratobi finally spoke, ignoring the slight tension in the air mostly caused by the redhead. Hizashi-san, how do you feel? Hayashi shifted a little, testing his limbs as he clenched and unclenched his hands. Stiff, but that will go away soon enough. May I trouble you for a cup of water, Hokage-sama? Saratobi immediately nodded, but Haruki was already moving back into the room, a cup of water in one hand. Wordlessly, he handed it to the Hyuga before backing away, glancing back into the kitchen as Saratobi and Hizashi realized that they could hear water beginning to boil. Hizashi nodded slowly in thanks, studying the redhead half-hidden in shadows with puzzled curiosity. The man didn't give off an unapproachable aura, and when he had woken up halfway back to Kanoha on the Flying Fox, Haruki's hold on him had been careful and protective. Now the man just seemed uneasy, as if he wasn't sure what to do with Izashi now that Izashi knew. And yes, he knew. He had picked up enough to realize this was the QB Jin Shiriki, and last time he had checked, Uzumaki Naruto had been the vessel, and should only be, by all means, eight years older than the last time he had glimpsed the boy. He suspected that the red hair was a hinge, though he couldn't detect anything. Hizashi had also figured out that this man was most likely from the future, or at least a parallel universe, not that he was an expert on the subject. And the casual way he had mentioned his son's name, even in passing, held a certain quality of warm affection and Hizashi had no doubt that the two had been friends. He could tell that this man was powerful too. A few Jutsu master, 
and an excellent strategist if the plan the man had spun on the spot was anything to go by. Studying the redhead carefully, Hisashi frowned at the exhaustion he could see in the tense line of the man's shoulders, a fatigue that he doubted was from his so-called mission to Kumo. I was far too old for such a young man confirmed that. And the way Haruki had mentioned war earlier, the deep disgust and grieving sorrow mixed together to form the word could only have come from a war veteran far too used to blood and death. But he had also felt the innate kindness in the redhead when the man had carried him home, had seen the absolute trust the Sandame had in Haruki and the instinctive attentiveness Haruki possessed when he had guessed what Hazashi had wanted before he had even asked for it. The kettle suddenly sounded and the redhead was already moving, a flash of crimson fire amongst the shadows. The kettle cut off, and the sound of cupboards opening and closing reached their ears. A minute later, Haruki was back, ramen in one hand and a fork in the other. Hazashi's eyebrows rose. The redhead had even caught the fact that there was no way his fingers would have enough dexterity to use chopsticks at the moment. Thank you, Hizashi spoke aloud this time, hoping to allay some of the worried anxiety flashing in the man's blue gaze by showing his own sincere gratitude. The redhead studied him for a moment, blue eyes piercing before the intensity disappeared and a softer look replaced the earlier tension in Haruki's features. You're welcome. The redhead huffed a little, the slightest hint of embarrassment showing on his face and Hizashi caught a glimpse of the blonde boy this man had grown up from. Saratobi, watching this exchange, tried not to let his amusement show. Really, first Kakashi, and now Izashi. Haruki was reeling people in without even being aware of it. All right, back to the plan. Saratobi drew their attention back to him as he turned to Haruki. It's an excellent plan. There are a few parts that will have to be smoothed out, but overall, since Hizashi san has agreed, we can work with it. Haruki nodded once in acknowledgement and Saratobi turned back to Izashi. For now, Hizashi san will have to stay here. No one comes into my office and the seals on the doors hide any chakra signals anybody give off once I activate them. Is that all right? Hizashi nodded as well and Saratobi turned once more to Haruki. Good work, Haruki Kuen. Go home and get some rest. I'll have one of my unbugo get you when the council convenes. You'll want to be present. Yes, Haruki ran a hand through his hair, adjusting his jown and vest as he got ready to leave. There is also another matter I want to speak to you about, but it can wait until tomorrow much as I don't like the idea. Right now, I suppose you'll want to move fast. Indeed. Saratobi agreed, already grinning. And Haruki Kuen? You might want to prepare yourself for a visit from Kakashi very soon. He's been running all over the village looking for you since you left five days ago. Haruki eyed the Hokage dubiously. Kakashi? Why? Saratobi shrugged. You seem to have made quite an impact on his gen and team. He wants to meet you, but it's been quite entertaining watching him looking for someone who hasn't even been here the entire time. I haven't seen him work so hard in a long time. Haruki snorted, rolling his eyes. Great. Not only is he a pervert, Kakashi's turned into a stalker. Just my luck. With one last shake of his head, the redhead nodded at Izashi, who had managed to stand, if somewhat unsteadily, and had sketched a respectful bow, the slightest of smiles on his face when he straightened up again. Thank you again, Haruki-san. Haruki flashed him the briefest of smiles, something on his face relaxing before he turned to Saratobi again and sketched his own salute. With a wave, the redhead disappeared and the remaining occupants could just catch the sound of Haruki's foot pushing off from the windowsill of the outer office. He's an interesting man, Hizashi commented after a short pause, sitting down again and picking up his ramen. Yes, Saratobi agreed genially. He has been great once, and there is no doubt in my mind that he will be great again whether or not he wishes to be so. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content. Click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.